using was purchased by the Friends of Brook Street Library. It's for people that have um, might have hearing difficulties, and if anybody ever needs one for one, needs a loop for any of our um, programs, we do have them in the back. If you have them in your hearing aid, if you have, um, I think, T-coils, it'll work directly through that, or we have a little device you can wear. So if you ever need any, just see us in the back, and we'll get that for you, all set up so you can hear it. Uh, anyways, without further ado, here's Amy Usowski, the Conservation Administrator of the Town of Howard. Thank you. Let's see where I should stand. How about can I stand over here? Everybody can see. Um, thank you, Suzanne. You're welcome. Um, again, I'm Amy Zowski. I'm the Conservation Administrator for the Town of Harwich. Um, my primary job is to uphold like the Wellness Protection Act and make sure people are doing the right things around their waterfront properties. But the other thing I really enjoy to do enjoy doing is land management. I'm a gardener myself, and my department runs the Harwich Community Gardens. Um, so I'm really happy to have the chance to get out and, and speak to you today. I wasn't sure what my audience was going to be, so um, the presentation is a little more simplistic. But if you have questions that you think I might be able to answer, there will be time at the end. And um, also, I'm not the I'm not, I'm not an expert necessarily, so maybe we all can participate in that. But um, seeing as how spring is coming, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the perfect time, <laughs> I am optimistic, eternally. Um, I thought it would be a good time to talk about pollinators, who they are, why they're important, and how to attract them. Um, we'll talk, I'll tell you a little bit more about an event that we're going to be doing in April um, that you two can come and participate in and get some seedlings. Um, in addition to the wildflower seeds that are up front, so if you didn't get some on the way out, please feel free and, and get some. Well, I forgot to mention this, too. I forgot to mention this. Sure, let me see that. It's on Harwich Reads. Yep. And the books are right there. Yep, thank you. And these are upstairs? Yep, this one right here. Okay. Um, there's also some pamphlets in the back or upstairs about the Harwich Community Reads program. It's a first ever community wide read. And on top of um, whatever books they're reading, there's also a whole list here of all the workshops like this one that are taking place during the late winter and early spring if you'd like to attend. If you have any questions, just ask me about it. So what are pollinators? Um, an agent that moves pollen from the male anthers of a flower to the female stigma, causing fertilization and reproduction. Um, they're pretty much anything. There's anything that is birds, bats, and bees, butterflies, moths, and beetles, any type of insect, really, um, and even people. I'm sure a lot of you here have been frustrated, like I have, and my tomatoes aren't pollinating, so I go in there with a little Q-tip or a brush, and I self-pollinate them. So. We ourselves, we ourselves are, are pollinators as well. <clears throat> and we're going to go through a list of some of the common pollinators. I'm going to touch on two or three in particular, but I'll give you kind of lists of all the other ones. And we'll talk about why they're important. Um, there's over 400 bee species in New England alone, which is unbelievable. Now, um, the honeybee one that we're all familiar with, is a single social species introduced from Europe during the colonial period. So these are not native to um, the United States, but you'll see further on in the presentation just how important they are um, to everyone's lives here in the United States. Uh, the honeybee have man-made hives and hollow trees. They survive in the winter um, but on with only a single queen. And I wanted to show you, who's familiar with the wild dance of the honeybee? Mm -hmm. Let's see if this works. We had it working. Oh, I had it. We had the bottom anyway. Yeah. Honeybees have some fascinating abilities. Among them being able to communicate by performing a unique dance. It informs hive mates where a newly discovered food. 
food source is located in. Every cycle of this waggle dance roughly describes the shape of the figure eight. Let's rewind and look in more detail. The B only waggles on a part of its route, a straight run indicated here by the wave line. The secret lies in the direction of the straight run, or to be more precise, in the angle between the straight run and the perpendicular, which in this case is 90 degrees to the left. This tells the other bees that food is available 90 degrees to the left of the sun. If the angle is 60 degrees to the right, they'll be flying 60 degrees to the right of the sun. So I saw this about 10, 15 years ago in college, and I was just amazed. So I, I show it every time. It's amazing just how smart and um, how far, how, how adaptive they are. Bumble versus honey because I get a lot of people saying one versus the other and um, they're not they're similar but not the same. Um, bumblebees are the cute fat honey uh, bumblebees that you see flying around. Um, they're fat and furry as opposed to a honeybee which is smaller and slim. Um, the bumblebee will live, live in a nest of four, uh, 50 to 400 bees well, the honeybee can live in nests that may be in the thousands, um, in the tens of thousands. Uh, for the bumblebee, only the queen hibernates, and she hibernates in the ground. Um, the queen and daughters may live in the hive all year for the um, honeybee. Bumblebees live in the wild. Honeybees can live um, either in man-made hives or in trees. Um, we don't really cultivate much of the honey for bumblebees because they, they make more of a honey-like substance and it's really only enough for those in their colony to survive on. They don't make an excess like the honeybee does and the honeybee is where we, we get most of our honey that we can buy. Um, who is familiar with colony collapse disorder? I'd say pretty much everybody if they're gardeners in here and that's who I think I'm talking to is primarily gardeners. Um, are probably familiar with that. And there's a whole different, there's a lot of different hypotheses on why it's happening. And I think it is a mixture of several things. Um, a very predominant one is um, a chemical called, uh, well, a group of chemicals called neonectinoids. And um, other factors are things such as mites, um, other insect infestations that they can have. Um, neonicotinoids are an insecticide that is used widespread, um, well here as well you can buy chemicals at the store that have this in it, but predominantly where, where a lot of our food crops are grown out in um, the central part of the country. Um, these are sprayed aerially um, from planes and what they are is they're, it's, it's like nicotine, it's like neurotoxin. Um, that in low doses won't hurt mammals, but in low doses causes long-term effects in bees and other, um, and other pollinators. It attacks the nervous system and makes them forget where their hive is, where their food so sources are. Um, it can give them seizures and it's, a, it's most people's belief, is including mine, that it's a predominant reason for colony collapse disorder and the decline of pollinators, especially the honeybee. Um, they're restricted in Europe and not in the United States. What you can do is um, save the Pollinators Act, and the link is here. And we can make this presentation available um, on the town website or, or through Suzanne with the library here. Um, but this is being, all being filmed as well, so we can make the slideshow and the video available. And um, to talk about least toxic pest control management, I'm not going to get into it too much other than really trying to push people to use organic as much as possible, use composting, um, really look at what you're buying. And um, insecticides are not just in sprays. They're in the seeds that you buy. They're in the soil that you buy. So 
just checking the bags, making sure you're buying organic. Um, that'll help the bees. That'll help the pollinators. And it gives you a nice organic produce as well. Couple, just a couple more examples. My favorite is the red-tailed bumblebee. Um, and just to show you how different the bees can be is uh, the sweet bee. It's a green bee. Um, would have, I would have never thought it was actually a bee until I looked it up about a year ago. And the carpenter bee, we're probably all familiar with getting buzzed around our houses and um, bees making holes. These are the bees that make holes in, in your woodwork. That's where they nest. Um, they don't eat it, they spit it out, and um, the thing is, is, believe it or not, even though they buzz you, the males with the big, round, black, shiny bottom, they don't have a stinger. They can't sting you. So they make a whole lot of noise, and they're more curious than anything. But I know that I've been a little bit of intimidated by them at times. <laughs> a little bee. <laughs> but no, they, they, they can't, they won't hurt you, and... Um, but they are territorial and curious. Um, butterflies. Um, found here in Harwich. Monarchs, swallowtails, whites and sulfurs, gossamer wing butterflies, coppers, azures, hair streaks, and skippers. And I have to say that because of our previous AmeriCorps volunteer with the town, um, Scott Barron, he kind of introduced me to being not only a birder, but a butterfly enthusiast. You can see, I've seen all of these at Thompson's Field in Harwich during um, June, July time period. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. And the uh, swallowtail that you do see the most of here on Cape Cod is the Eastern Black, but there are whole different varieties. And then, they're not out yet, the ages, but they will be. They will be. They're very early. Those in the cabbage whites tend to be pretty early. That's right. And then the monarch. Um, there's a really large push right now in the environmental community to save the monarch. Um, so a little bit about it. It's a milkweed butterfly. The caterpillars feast on the milkweed plant. And the milkweed plant is what makes them poisonous. So it's... Um, it's a chemical deterrent from them being eaten, so milkweed is important. And when the caterpillar becomes a butterfly, you'll notice that um, they have distinct striping patterns and that they have these eye spots on the edges of their wings. Now where these eye spots are, are where the most toxicity in the butterfly is. So when a predator comes and wants to eat the butterfly, they're looking at the eye spots. That's where they're gonna, that's where they're gonna attack. When they attack close to the eye spots, they get the highest dose of toxin and bad taste. Mm -hmm. um, they're not currently a protected species. A protection request has been filed with EPA. And they do migrate annually. Another, another species that is very, very susceptible to chemicals. There's all different types of milkweed. The common one that you will see mostly at Thompson's Field and around Harwich are common swamp and butterfly milkweed. Um, the butterfly is pretty stunning when it comes out in bloom, and we have lots and lots of it. There's also world milkweed and poke milkweed. Pokeweed is the one that has the purple berries. Is that pokeweed? That is pokeweed, yeah. And this is just a picture of a couple of the other ones. Um, cabbage white with the cloud is, and the cloud is sulfur. These are all fairly small. I mean, your, your monarch is about that big. These are only about this big. Spring azures, as Jerry mentioned, are one of the first to come out, as well as cabbage whites. Um, all of these have been found at Thompson's Field. I have a little bit of a hard time sometimes with the orange and the clouded sulfurs, and you can you can see why. Plus, they're really fast moving. So. And I can't forget the hummingbirds. Um, here we predominantly have two types: the ruby-throated and the rufous. And you can tell the differences. In most um, creatures, the male is more showy than the female. Why are 
are they so important? They're vital to the reproductive success of 75% of the Earth's flowering plants. About a third of that, or about a third of what we eat is directly connected to pollinators. Um, the demand on the, is on the rise for food that is um, pollinated by pollinators, and the number of pollinators is, of course, in decline. We're dependent on the fruits, nuts, and berries. Um, and then again, over 150 food crops that we ourselves ingest depend on pollinators. We not only depend on them for food, but we depend on them for fiber, fuel, and medicine. Um, something that's been in the news and online a lot lately is the decline of the bees in the southern part of the United States where they produce cotton. Cotton is, um, they spray the cotton with the insecticides when the cotton flower is in bloom, so when the, it just holds all the insecticide right there. So when the pollinators come and cotton is primarily pollinated by bees, they get a very lethal dose right off the bat. <laughs> so what can we do? Um, the harmful practices that we do right now, destruction of natural ecosystems, and overuse of chemicals, as I've said, kind of time and time again, fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides. Um, avoid pesticides such as Roundup, Dicamba, Pyclorum, and Triclopyr. These are things that you can purchase here at your local stores. Um, manicured lawns, they may look great, um, but they're not really great for wildlife and pollinators. When you're looking for pollinators, as you all know, your own gardeners, diversity is really key. Um, so a monoculture with a very dense, packed um, surface isn't, isn't good for really any insects. Um, they can't burrow, there's no flowers. Usually something like that is highly treated. Um, so keep your natural vegetation wherever possible, or at least have edges if you can. And that's um, another reason that I brought in some wildflowers here, um, is to create things like edges if you have to have somewhat of a, of a Cape Cod lawn that doesn't require fertilization. <laughs> um, Overcompaction of the soil is an issue again as well because of burrowers, but you also, um, you don't want to tell it too much because then you can disrupt the habitat. So it's kind of a fine balance with that one. And collection of firewood. I know a lot of, I come across a lot of people in my line of work who want to clean up their yard. And I have to admit, I like to clean up my yard too. Um, but always make sure, if you can, to leave some dead wood, some leaf litter behind, if you can, in your yard. Um, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I live in the woods now, so it's, <laughs> uh, when in doubt, natural is best. So here's just a couple. I I'm not going to read them all out. Um, these will be available for you to, to look at. Um, a website that is really good is beyondpesticides.org. And this, um, this, all this came from, but it has a lot of other helpful tips as well. And because I'm telling you here, I'm saying, no, 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 don't use any of this stuff. Got to give you some alternatives to use. So. OK, so what you can do. Don't use the aforementioned bad chemicals. If you have to have a lawn, keep it a Cape Cod lawn. And Cape Cod lawn, what I mean is rise and fescues. They're cold season grasses. They really don't requ require irrigation other than a first time squirt to get them going. Um, it's not going to be your beautiful manicured green, green, full lawn, but it will give you a lawn. Um, again, mix of hardy rise and fescues, even a couple of weeds. Less maintenance means more time to enjoy the beach. <laughs> Choose plants from the native Cape Cod plant list. You can go to the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension website or to me, your local friendly conservation administrator who has these available for you. Um, these plants are plants that are, are from here, adaptive, are easily adaptable when you plant them. Um, most of them are fruiting and flowering. So, um, not only native, they're good for all kinds of wildlife. Um, create an organic garden, create a pollinator garden around your vegetable garden. Um, 
something that I'm sure a lot of you do and that I'm starting to do is around my garden along the edge of the fence because I don't want the little critters from getting in. Um, I plant I plant wildflowers all around the edge of my garden. So a couple of examples of desirables. Um, really, uh, like I said before, um, diversity is key. These are just a couple of examples of what you will see. Um, thistles, bees love thistles, coneflowers again, butterfly weed, another milkweeds for your butterflies, um, and, and sunflowers. The, um, the baggie of plants that I have available for you has 27 different varietals of native New England wildflower seeds that you can all take. Um, but half of them are perennials and half of them are annuals. And I'll go over, I might as well go over it right now, how you plant them. <laughs> you really um, want to just sprinkle them lightly on a tilled area and then cover them with the very finest, finest little bit of sand and then water them down good. And this is after the last frost. Um, they're good in sun to shade, not full shade. Um, and you will get a huge variety of colors and sizes out of that. Hmm? Turn it over somehow. <laughs> and then um, you say, well, what if I live on the beach and I have sand for soil? Or if you live pretty much on Cape Cod and I have sand for soil, what can I do? Um, Carolina or Virginia rose are, are good alternatives to Rosa Rugosa. Uh, Rosa Rugosa has been really popular, but it's kind of becoming a slight invasive out here. So in conservation, we're not recommending Rugosa rose anymore, which is the salt spray rose that you see around. We're recommending the Virginia or Carolina. It looks very similar, but they're not, they don't spread as much. Uh, seaside goldenrod and, and beach plum, both, you know, beach plum for its flowering and its fruiting and for its ability to live in full sun, windy, poor soil conditions. In your community, you can get involved. Um, both the town and the trust, if you're familiar, I mean, they have wonderful opportunities for volunteers in the community. Um, I always need help at the community gardens, wink, wink. <laughs> um, <laughs> Speak with applicable departments and practices on town lands. I work a lot with the highway department and the rec department and I'm starting to work with the golf department um, on, on their practices and just, just seeing how we can get just a little bit better on them, but still providing services for the people in the town. Um, environmental events like Earth Day and Arbor Day. Earth Day, I think, is the last or second to last week in April. Arbor Day is the last Friday in April, and every day, every year on Arbor Day, I hold a seedling giveaway. They're free. <laughs> um, they're available at Town Hall. You'll get to see a flyer in a minute. But everything we pick is native to the Northeast. We try to do a variety of a few different types of shrubs, a tree, and then of course the wildflowers, which are which are popular for everybody. At Beehives, your local community garden. Um, we had beehives at ours for years, and unfortunately the person who was doing our beehives no longer is going to be doing them. So if you know of anybody or want to help us bring the beehives back to the Harwich Community Gardens, please contact me. My card is over there on the table. And create pollinator gardens. A couple of my favorite books and where I got a lot of this information. And there's my seedling giveaway. So Friday, April 24th, 9 a.m. to 12 in the Harwich Town Hall parking lot on Old Colony Road. Those, these are the, what I'm going to be offering this year. Um, black elderberries, Indian currants, nine bark, uh, hackberry trees, and northeast pollinator seeds. And it's first come, first served. I have a bunch in my office. I'll show you them for you. Perfect. My references. Thank you. Can I Does anybody have any questions, comments? What? Oh, I just have a comment um, about mason bees um, because they're terrific pollinators. 
And I've just this year, I've, I've got little uh, mason bee larvae in my refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And they require special little homes. They're little, little homes that look like birdhouses. And they're kind of fussy. I have to create a mud bath. Uh -huh. <laughs> but anyway, they're supposed to, I'm just going to see how it works. And there's a there's a site called Crown Bee, Crown Bee something, mm -hmm. or something. And um, it, it just, they're such fantastic pollinators. Yeah. Uh, they don't make honey or anything. Um, they're benign. They don't sting. They don't cause any reaction. And um, I'm on the board at the um, uh, Meeting House Farm in, in West Barnstable. And um, I'm going to put up a couple houses there. That's and wonderful. And just see, hopefully, hopefully I can. There's also uh, leaf cutter bees. Mason bees are spraying and leaf cutters are in the summer. I'll, I'm going to try both of them. What was that? Sorry. Leaf cutter are the other bees. Yes. Yeah. I've heard of those. I've never heard of mason bees. They don't bees. make hives or anything. They mm -hmm. just lay little eggs. And, mm -hmm. and you can harvest the larvae and you put them back in your refrigerator. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Just real quick, in case you don't know, we have a seed lending library upstairs. Right as you walk in, it's at the top of the stairs for now. And they are all heirloom and open pollinated um, seeds. A lot of them are from high mowing seeds. I put some in this year. Last year I started it really late. But now they're, they're available now. So when people are planting their gardens, um, if anyone has any questions on how it works, just ask us up there. It, it explains how it works up there. I have a question for you. I was a beekeeper for years. I had four hives. And, but it became, I was a lazy beekeeper. <laughs> and then it became, really, you had to know what you were doing because of the, the raw mite. And there's another disease that they have. You had to time your, you had to treat them if you really wanted to take care of them. So I, I gave it up. Mm -hmm. And I had a neighbor who um, started beehives. I'm not going to treat them. I'm not going to treat them. And other apiarists are thinking that this might be a problem for our native pollinators if, if we're allowing these bees that have mites, could it at some point jump into the native pollinators, these diseases, if you don't, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. If you don't treat, do you think people should be responsible with their honeybees? Or take yeah, a I chance? Think, I think people should be responsible with their bees. I'm not a beekeeper. Um, I'm learning. But I'm not. I don't consider myself a beekeeper, um, so I really I, I don't want to give you advice necessarily. But it, it seems I mean mites mites can spread, so it would make sense that they could spread to other bees and other colonies. I was just curious if you. Does had anybody else in the room know? Are, are you going to that meet your farmer on Saturday by any chance <coughs> at the community center? Because Nancy Hip might know. Okay. Yes, um, just She'll to make an announcement. with the garden club, and she, she teaches. Um, oh, I just had an opinion, bee, because I, I couldn't treat them, because yeah. I wanted to keep my yeah. bees healthy. Well, she I just tried to stop no, beekeeping, because you know. I didn't want to do that, because yeah. right. I was eating the honey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can't well, eat the honey, kind of but the mix, you, have you, know? to really, you have to really think about what you're doing. Exactly. It's the mix. And do you want to treat, to or do you, you know, want to treat them with something, or do you want to take And his hives did die. He did die. He's like, oh, I'm just getting the bees every year. Well, that's kind of an expensive. Yeah, I know a lot of people who, who do that. Really? They just don't treat, and they just, they, yep. yeah. Yep. Um, either they keep the hives in susceptible areas and wrong areas and have to replace the hives every year, or they die off. Um, when you treat them, uh, does that make them not organic? What do you treat them with? Is it something yeah. like that? Medicines. Medicines. To treat them. Mm -hmm. um, the local farmer event, or meet your local farmer is a good question. Huh. That would be a good question. Yeah. Ask, um, it is Saturday, Saturday from 2 to 4 at the Harwich Community Center. It's put on the Harwich, by the Harwich Conservation Trust. Right. And, the and the farmers and the garden club. Right. Well, no, it's there's a, a lot of people participating. I'm just saying that Nancy will be at our table. At the oh, okay. Table, and she is a bee person. Okay, I'm sorry. I was I can't. We'll be there. My, my mistake. We'll see the library. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I don't know if 40 people will be there. Awesome. I'm going to try to go. Yeah. Okay.
So if you have any like more, I know this was kind of a basic presentation because you never know who you're going to get. Um, so if you do have, if you think of more questions, um, my card is there. Um, if I don't know the answer, I can look it up for you. I'm more than happy to help. And the reference department upstairs can also. That's right. I forget you. where I am. You're at the library. <laughs> she has the reference department and they'll find you the answer also. <laughs> or we probably have books on it here. You probably do. It's a library. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Please pick up some um, some seeds on your way out. There's a little pollinator book, and there's also advertising sheets um, for the first annual community cleanup here in Harwich. We're calling it Tour to Trash, and it's going to be the first Saturday in May. If it's rainy, it'll be on that Sunday, and we're, our goal is um, to clean the entire town, to um, my, the town of Harwich and the Conservation Trust and a lot of our volunteers have gotten together and made a steering committee and um, picked out groups, and we have sponsors, and we're going to have free food, and we're going to, it's going to be a, a wonderful morning, so the, the advertisement's there if you want to take one. I'm from East Hammond, so I was wondering, you know, um, other towns are doing, this is a wonderful presentation, and I know that the community needs to be much better educated than they are. Mm -hmm. And um, by the community, I mean, well, the entire country, but right. <laughs> we can deal with Cape Cod here. Right. But, so do you know what level of education is going on? Is it, is anything happening on the town, you know, Cape wide level or I mean this is a great presentation that there are a lot of workshops that the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension work um, puts on as well as um, uh, different towns do have some presentations like like this but I don't know how widespread it is I actually worked in East Ham before I came to Harwich oh. I was the conservation administrator there for a few years so okay. yeah I um, when, when the whole NSTAR thing started came across my desk and I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, so these this, these can be made available, absolutely. Um, I think the knowledge is growing out there. As far as um, do people, are people making the presentations? I mean, yeah, if we just have to find time, really, is where it's at. The Garden Club has one. It's in this flyer. April 22nd at the Natural History at the Natural yeah. History oh, Museum and you have to you have to register for it but if you take one of these flyers it's on the back mm -hmm. it's called what's the buzz improve your garden by learning about the importance of bees how to attract them and protect them and it's Nancy Hip mm -hmm. that's doing it yeah. so that's part of this um, community yeah. need that we're doing part of which I have to say really really fantastic between the library the community center and just how dedicated people are here in Harwich, as well as the trust. I mean, I work so closely with them and they help me yeah. so much in my work um, that I just hope other communities, um, if they're not doing this, can, can get there. Yeah, and we all work together. We're reading the book Animal Vegetable Miracle. Mm -hmm. I know it's an older book, but it's all about sustainable communities. Right. There's stuff on heirloom seeds. There's probably stuff on pesticides in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're reading The Secret Garden as a mm -hmm. kid's book, too. And we have a couple more uh, book discussion groups doing it, if anybody wants to join us. But definitely take a flyer. There's still a lot of activities left. It's still, uh, we have History of Cape Cod Gardening coming up on the 21st. And then this whole back page still. The uh, Museum of Natural History has a plant sale on mm -hmm. June 6th. That's and right. We emphasize native plants, yeah. and the New England Wildflower Society will be selling plants there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, if you want to know where I got these seeds, I got them from American Meadows. They're based out of Vermont. There's a whole bunch of different seed mixes, and they're non-treated. Um, so that's where I purchased them. But if you want to get them in large quantities, um, you can purchase them from them at a much reduced rate than you could, you know, buy a little packets of around here. Mm -hmm. American Meadows. Oh. They're out of Vermont. You can go on the website. I'm going to put some in the seed lending library. I'm going to get to that this year, hopefully. Sure. So I'll give you we'll have some available here. So these are, I mean, these are last year's, but they'll stay good for a few years. Um, I'll have brand new ones in at the end of April at the um, Arbor Day Seedling Giveaway. 
Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.